think it'd be hard to miss all the stuff that's going on right now. There's so much chaos, so much confusion, so many mixed messages, forceful opinions, and uh, everyone is putting theirs out there and clamoring for attention, screaming for the spotlight. There's so much going on. We, each one, depending on where our priorities lie or what's where our interest may perhaps be or our background or personal experiences or whatever the situation may be, may be prone to look at one sector more than the other. You got the inequality here, we've got the inequality over there, we've got the uh, protesting and the looting and the tearing up of stuff, we've got the virus, we've got the government ever becoming more intrusive in our personal lives. And by the way, everything that they give you, they're taking away a freedom. Make no mistake about that. And I think that it is very easy to overlook everything that's taking place collectively and, and become focused on one or two areas. But I wanna make sure that we don't do that. And I wanna make sure that we understand that it all goes together and it is not by accident, that it is all being very much uh, orchestrated, it's intentional, it's part of an in-game plan, if you will. The Bible's very clear. The gathering of the forces, the dividing asunder, those who have tried to play the no man's land, the middle ground, uh, are being drawn to either one side or the other. Uh, and I think that it's important for us as Christians that we look at the basics, see where we're at, see if we've got all the bases covered as much as we possibly can, and the areas that the Holy Spirit would point out to us that need to be shored up, folks, I'm telling you, it's time to shore them up. And what I'm going to talk to you this morning about is the Word. Don't just turn me off right now. That's too basic. It's too elementary. Hold on to your seats. I'll explain to you why it's not. Uh, it's no coincidence either that uh, the Lord moved on Kalika's heart to write the part that she did. I never saw it that it went in print this morning and was delivered at the church. Uh, I don't censor stuff. If I ask you to do something, I'm not going to censor what the Lord tells you to do. And uh, when I saw it, it's like, oh my goodness, that's amazing because it is exactly what we're going to talk about this morning. Let's begin and go ahead and jump in here at verse 9. It says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word, 119 and verse 9. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Merciful Heavenly Father, Lord God, I pray that you would uh, run the enemy from this place right now. I know that anywhere where your truth is being preached, that you are being represented accurately, honestly, candidly. Uh, courageously this morning that the enemy is right there planting seeds of doubt and disruption and distraction and uh, attempting in every way to pour cold water on what's being said and what's being done. And so, Lord, I pray that you would cause him to flee from this place even now. I pray that you would remove from our minds the things that we have each brought to this place this morning that might serve to interrupt our thought patterns and, uh, and keep us from having ears to hear and eyes to see. And, Lord, I just pray that uh, you would speak clearly to each and every heart here this morning, that you would meet each and every person uh, in their most desperate place with what they most desperately need and not that they might just simply consume it uh, as, as someone would uh, going through the drive through that was hungry, but that they would take it, apply it, uh, and use it to glorify you for the advancement of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. We have all known people who... Uh, figuratively at least could wallow with the pigs and seemingly uh, come out smelling like a rose. 
And we've also known people who couldn't walk through a field with one cow pile in the whole field without it finding them and coming out with it all over them. The writer of Psalm 119 asked a riveting question. How do we stay clean in a dirty world? It's impossible to completely separate or isolate oneself from the rest of the world. I know no way that you can possibly do that. Most of us, at least, that think like we tend to think, uh, understand plainly that we have to earn a living. There are bills to be paid and responsibilities to be met and things that require that we go out and provide a service or a product in order to exchange that for money in order to take care of what we need and so that we can survive. Is everybody with me? You know what we're talking about? Yeah. Okay. For most of that, for most of us, that means working outside of the house. It means working outside of the home and around other people whom we cannot control. We have to go to the stores, as unpleasant as it is these days. We have to go to the stores to buy the things that we need. We're limiting the number of trips that we make. We're eating everything in the house, including the cardboard boxes, seemingly. It's not like, well, I've eaten everything I like, let's go to the grocery. No, let's eat everything we got, then we go to the grocery. It's not fun to go to the stores, and we have to go to the stores in order to buy the things that we need. We have social commitments in addition to going to the stores and having to work, for the most part, outside the home. Our children, someday again soon, uh, will go to school with the children of strangers. And even if it were possible, and even if we did have Paul Smith's money <laughs> so that we could hold ourselves up like some hermit, we still wouldn't be spared from the influence of our closest friends and families. And so we seem to be forced to swim in a sea that is filled with every form of filthiness. The temptation to do wrong will always be stronger than the desire to do right. The invitations to do evil will always be much more plentiful than the invitations, hey, Joe, Frank, Billy, let's just do some good. From a text, let's just, I don't know, let's text, let's just do some good. When's the last time you got one of those texts? When's the last time you got one of those phone calls? No, it's, hey, meet me. Erase. The invitations to do wrong will always be so much more plentiful than the invitations to do right. How do we swim in a sea that is filled with all kinds of filthiness without becoming stained ourselves? Maybe the question is, how do we swim, Jeff, in a sea that is filled with all kinds of filthiness without drowning? The answer is the Word. The Word. What word are we talking about? The Word. The Word. This Word. This one right here. This one. <laughs> I got it, finally. This Word. Is what we're talking about. Not another word, not a similar word, not somebody else's word. Not what Kanye West said, although he had some good things to say this week. Took some real heat for something that he actually did say that made sense. <laughs> Along with some other, what word are we talking about? I'm talking about the word. The word of God. The word of God is our lifeline. The word of God is our life vest. We take Grayson and Paisley, our grandchildren, to uh, my parents, my sister's pool to swim. They wear life vests there. The Word of God is our life vest. The Word of God is our life raft. It is keeping us afloat and unstained 
Although we must traverse the sea that is filled with all forms of filthiness, we are supported above that sea. We do what needs to be done, what has to be done in order to get through this life as a pilgrim on a journey, but we do not have to soak bobbing literally to our eyeballs, getting saturated to the very core with the same filthiness that we're forced to navigate. Amen, preacher. That's really, really good. The Word of God is our life raft, keeping us afloat and unstained. Now, here's the problem. Therefore, Satan seeks to distract, discourage, and divide us from the Word of God. And can we just all admit this morning that he does a pretty good job of it? Because Satan does everything. With, see, see, unlike ourselves, Satan is convinced of one thing. The word of God is absolute truth. And whether you subscribe to it or not, whether you want to live by it or not, is a different matter from the fact that it's absolute truth. And he, unlike ourselves, is convinced that if he cannot keep us from the word of God, that it will change the way we think, the way we act, and the way that we do, the way that we treat ourselves, the way we conduct ourselves both in public and private. Amen. Amen. He knows these things. And so he does everything within his power to dissuade us from reading and applying God's word to our lives. I'm too busy. I don't have time. Gosh, preacher, have you ever tried to raise two or three children? <laughs> I run a heating and air business. I know he's busy. Have you ever tried to do that, preacher? Or about grandchildren? Some of you all are raising grandchildren. For all practical purposes, you're raising grandchildren. Preacher, have you ever tried to do that? Well, I don't understand what I'm reading. I don't get anything out of what I'm reading. You see, it's easy to place all the blame on Satan, and certainly he's guilty. The devil made me do it, is a famous line from yesteryear. The comedian uh, Flip Wilson, name almost got away from me. Used it often, if you remember. The devil made me do it. And certainly Satan is guilty for being able to dissuade and divide and separate us from the word of God. But you and I must also acknowledge that we too are at fault. As convincing as Satan can be, no one can make, listen carefully, I don't like what you're saying, preacher, I can't help it. I don't want to hear what you're saying. You need to hear what I'm saying. As convincing as Satan can be, no one can make us do something we don't want to do. Grayson, leave the microphone alone. Grayson, quit playing with the microphone. Grayson, get your mouth off the... Grayson, Gra He wants to have... Future music director, worship leader... Kid's got to get his hands on it, right? He can't wait. Hey, the truth of the matter is, folks, nobody can make us do something we don't want to do. It's not going to happen. I dare say that there wasn't a single thing that you really wanted to do this past week. Anybody, Brett, David, HB, Michael, Shelby, Treva, Paul Smith, Jennifer, there wasn't anything, there was not a single thing that you really wanted to do this past week that you didn't somehow find a way to do or have made plans to do sometime in the very near future, the nearest future that you can possibly manage. The truth is we find the time to do the things that we really want to do. What then are some possible reasons that we might lack the desire to read the Bible? Number one, we haven't read enough of it to become interested. We haven't read it enough to even get interested in it. We heard somebody else's perspective on it. We heard some loud wind, wind, windbag preacher 
preach it once or twice. We heard our interpretation of some liberal co-worker that tramples all over grace and subscribes to cheap grace and bends and twists scripture out of context. And, but, but we haven't read enough of it ourselves to even become interested in it. One doesn't pick up a novel, read the preface or the introduction to it, and then toss it aside. Do we do that? At the same time, one doesn't thumb through a book, reading a paragraph or two, and then decide that it's boring, infrequent reading, unfocused reading, reading without purpose or intent, will have us neglect the best of books, even the Bible. A favorite cherished book is a book that is read. Not one that is collecting dust on a shelf, stashed away in a box, or riding around in the rear window of your automobile. I'll let you get out first. I won't, I won't walk through the parking lot. A treasured book is a book that is read and reread regularly. And the Bible is no different. It doesn't matter what we say about this book. Sarah, cheek. It doesn't matter what we say about this book. Preacher, that book's more important to me than life itself. I love that book. It's a good book. All right. Show me where he's reading in it this week. If I, if I bring it around, can you? Don't bring it around, preacher. If you do, I won't come back. Because if you show me, you're going to have to tell me what it says without looking at it. <laughs> I love it, preacher. I love it. It doesn't matter what we say about it. It doesn't matter at all. All that matters is what we do with it and what we allow it to do with us. We don't read the Bible because we haven't read the Bible. We don't want to read the Bible because we haven't read it often enough or enough of it to even become interested in it. We lack the desire to read the Bible because we haven't read it enough to become interested. Number two, we don't want to read the Bible because we don't believe it's reliable. Or at best, it's only partly true. We believe that the Bible contradicts itself, or we believe those who would have us believe that it does. Is anybody with me this morning? We believe that the Bible contradicts itself or we believe those who would have us believe that it does. We doubt the historical accuracy of major events as they are described in the Bible, the creation story. Now, preacher, we, 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 we evolved from apes. I heard, a, I heard a story. Someone told me that a Christian told them that the other day. Just couldn't buy the creation story. That's what we're talking about, folks. We doubt the historical accuracy of major events as they are described in the Bible, the creation story, the flood, the parting of the Red Sea, etc. Anything that science cannot explain, we struggle to believe. We are shamed into thinking that if we accept biblical accounts, at face value, that we will be considered simple and unlearned. Do not tell me that peer pressure ends with a high school diploma. We don't want to read the Bible because we believe that the Bible is just another book, a collection of okay stories. An allegory, perhaps, but not something to be taken literally. We don't want to read the Bible because we haven't read enough of it to get interested. We don't want to read the Bible because we don't believe it to be literally true in its entirety. Number three, we don't want to read the Bible because we don't believe it's relevant. That was then, and this is now. Times have changed, preacher. You need to get up with the times. Each successive generation thinks that they have the corner, the market cornered on new. How many knows what we're talking about? You thought it when you were growing up. Your kids think it about you right now. 
Your grandparents thought it about their parents, and each successive generation thinks that they have the market cornered on new, a new day, a new set of challenges. Certainly a new day with new challenges requires a new way of doing things. Anything less is out of touch, old fashioned, obsolete. Today, many people, even Christians, disagree with important parts of the Bible. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. We have allowed popular culture to redefine fundamental institutions and foundational beliefs, and it continues to this very day. Marriage is no longer uh, just between a man and a woman. Ted and Fred can get married just as easily as Mary and Paul. Marriage itself means virtually nothing. While we're at it, let's redefine gender. Now we have he, she, and I gotta be careful here, it. <laughs> Do you wanna know what your kids and grandkids are talking about? I can tell you, but you probably don't wanna know. Sexual identity, how they identify. and what their sexual preference is. If you don't believe me, ask a middle school teacher. Hear from them all the time. Talk to the mom whose daughter can't ride the public school bus anymore because all the girls that she grew up with in her complex from before kindergarten now into middle school or if all decided they're lesbian or at least bisexual, it is rampant in Jessamine County public school system. The majority of the little girls that are running around are either lesbians, identify as lesbians, or bisexual, because it is cool. You don't believe me, ask the teachers. That's how far we've gone. Babies are no longer human beings until someone wants them and takes them home from the hospital. Even if we believe that the Bible has relevancy, we're much more likely to hold other people to its standards than we are to submit to those same standards ourselves. We don't want to read the Bible because we don't believe it's relevant to our life. Number four, we don't want to read the Bible because we have a heart that is only half warm toward God we have divided loyalties. We are only partially convinced that God's way is truly the only way. We haven't fully committed ourselves to following Jesus. We hope we've gone far enough to get in on heaven, but not so far that we'll miss out on anything now. In the movie War Room, a senior Miss Clara played by Karen Abercrombie uses a lukewarm cup of coffee. Calvin, did you catch that part? She uses a lukewarm cup of coffee to make a spiritual point. When a much younger Elizabeth, played by Priscilla Shearer, expresses her displeasure at being given a half cold cup of coffee, Miss Clara replies, people enjoy a hot cup of coffee. People enjoy a cold cup of coffee, but no one wants a half warm cup of coffee. Just prior to this, Elizabeth had told Miss Clara that she was just doing okay spiritually. There's no such thing as just doing okay spiritually, folks. Remember this, half warm won't get it done. We don't wanna read the Bible because we haven't read it enough to become interested. We don't want to read the Bible because we don't believe it to be literally true in its entirety. We don't want to read the Bible because we don't believe it's relevant for our lives, maybe somebody else's. We don't want to read the Bible because we have a heart that is only half warm toward God. When the people of God believe that they don't have time for the Word of God or that it takes more than the Word of God, indifference is what we harvest.
when the people of God read and apply the word of God, spiritual awakening, revival is the result. Last week we learned that it is time for judgment to begin at the house of God, and so too it is for revival. God wants us to live lives that are pleasing to him. How can we do that if we don't even know what he wants? It is time that we got serious about our faith because the world is getting serious about destroying our faith. And Satan will never defeat God but he's giving it everything he's got because he knows that the time is short. Don't be one of those on-the-fence Christians that gets sucked right in the middle of it and winds up finding out that you did battle on the wrong side, that you became an unwitting casualty of war, or that maybe you skirted through all of your life professing something you didn't even have a clue about. It's time to get serious about your faith. Why? Because the enemy is. The enemy is. This book that you've got right here is more important than any other possession that you have. And even then you don't possess it. It is on loan from God. It is a gift. Don't treat it lightly. Don't treat it like it's something that you might go to when, if, It is a lifeline. It is a life vest. It is a life wrap. There is nothing else. There's no substitute for this. The little friends that you got right now that get you into everything that's coming and going, the older friends that you got that still get you into everything coming and going, where will they be? Where will they be when the day of reckoning comes? They won't be anywhere to be found. It won't be funny then. It won't be hip then. It won't be cool then. It won't be the in vogue thing to do now. All of that will be gone. And nothing will be left except what you have done with this and what you've allowed it to do with you. You're never too young to make this a daily part of your life, the reading of the Word of God. You're never too old. Preacher, I can't even see the ink on the pages anymore. By a recording. By a recording. Preacher, I never even learned to read. By a recording. Preacher, I can't afford to buy a recording. Get somebody to read it to you. I can't understand what I'm reading. Get something you can understand that you're reading. I like the King James Version myself. I was born, raised on it, cut my spiritual teeth on it. It's my go-to, it's my devotional, it's my study time. It, but if you can't understand Old English, get something you can understand. I'm not one of these preachers that's going to stand up and tell you if you didn't get saved out of the King James Version Bible, you didn't get saved. I don't believe that. So if you can't read this one, get one you can read. If you can't read the one you get, get something else. Get your kids' Bibles. When we have the grandchildren down to the house, Shreva brings the children's Bible, brought it into the bedroom Friday night, and got the kids up on the love seat. And I went ahead and said, quit disturbing me, you're bothering me. I covered my head up and <laughs> she got the kids up there and got their attention. Now we're gonna read before we go to bed and then we're gonna pray. Well, preacher, I just don't think I have time for that. I just don't think our family would work that way. They will if you, they will if you, ooh, ooh, ooh. they will if you, you'll never regret that you did, you'll regret that you didn't one day, because your kids will be gone soon enough, but you don't want them to be gone, gone, you just want them out of the house. She brings the book in, and she reads. She says, Grayson, do you want to read it, or do you want me to read it? And then they pray. We pray. You're never too young to start. 
I see, I, w I like to watch Dr. David Jeremiah. He's got a Bible for everybody. Yeah. That's how he says, he got a Bible for everybody. Dr. Jeremiah got a Bible for everybody. <laughs> and he does. There's a Bible for everybody. Bible for everybody. Coleman, there's a Bible for you. It's a Bible for everybody in this room. Take the effort to get it and then fall in love with it. I didn't get anything out of it today. Read it again tomorrow. Get anything out tomorrow. Read it again the next day. It's a funny thing about the Bible, and don't take this the way it's probably going to sound. It's an acquired taste and it grows on you. Amen. I'm just speaking from experience. The more you read it, the more you love it. The more you read it, the more you want to read it. Pick it up and read it today and don't read it for three weeks, you're never going to want to read it again. Right. Same way with coming to church. I saw something the other day, Trevor showed me on Facebook, said the problem with missing church is eventually you won't miss church. And it's the same way with your Bible. It is an acquired taste. It takes a regular dose to keep you hooked up to it, to keep you in love with it, to keep you reading it. And the more you read it, the more you understand it. Of course, the more of the mind of God that you're able to comprehend as he speaks to you. The mind of God is an unfathomable thing to explore it to its depths. You cannot do it. And that's why they call it faith. And you can only understand so much of it at one time. And Julie, I know you know what I'm talking about. You read something, you've done devotions for years. I personally know your devotional life and I know you have. And I know you've read the Bible more times than probably you could count because you wouldn't be the one that would go around telling everybody, I've read the Bible every day of my life for 80 years. <laughs> oh. But every time you read a passage that you've read before, God shows you more and your depth of understanding increases and your love for that truth or that passage and the desire to apply it to your life is greater than ever before. Am I telling the truth? But it will never happen beforehand. You will never fall in love with the Word of God until you read it, until you've read it regularly, until you make it a regular part of your life. Everything else out there, well, I just don't know if I need it. Well, everything else out there is forcing itself upon you, and you are being impacted by everything else out there, whether you realize it or not. You have got a countermeasure that's more powerful than that, but you have to use it. Use it. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgment of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word.